On this episode of This Week in Space, we're talking about dangers from space with Dr. Ed Liu of the B612 Foundation and the Asteroid Institute. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 68, recorded on June 30th, 2023. Danger from the Skies. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Danger from the Skies edition. I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and I'm here with the impervious Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief of Space.com. How are you today, Dr. I'm Malik? doing. I'm doing well, Rod. I'm doing well. Uh, how are you doing? How are things going on on your, your coast today? Well, very good, and I'm excited to say that today we're being joined by Dr. Ed Liu, who has a resume. Let's see, I'm measuring right now. Yeah, it's longer than my left arm. Uh, <laughs> But he is a former astronaut, the executive director of the Asteroid Institute, which is a program of the B-12 Foundation, which we'll be talking 612. about. B-612 Foundation. Let's get that right, Mr. Pyle. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> uh, he was an astronaut for 12 years and, among many other achievements, invented the Gravity Tractor, which we'll also be talking about, and is a co-founder of the B-612 Foundation which is a leading sponsor of Asteroid Day, which happens to be today, June 30th. Yay. is being celebrated worldwide. And thank you for joining us, Dr. Lou. Oh, thank you very much for having me on your show. I'm so glad you could take time because you probably have a fairly busy schedule with Asteroid Day going on, right? It's a busy day. We're honoring Rusty Schweigart today for his contributions to all sorts of things related to space, but planetary defense in particular. And we're celebrating Asteroid Day. So it's, uh, it's going to be a good day. That's exciting. All right. Well, not to drag it down too far, but I have to do a space joke because we always do a space joke. And this one I'll have to take credit for, for better or worse. Hey, Tarek. Yes, Rod. I was reading a new article about an asteroid colliding with Earth. I couldn't finish it. You know why? Why? It hit too close to home. <laughs> oh, 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 I didn't get crickets this time. Thank <laughs> you. Well, as always. We invite you to join Team Tarek and send us your best or worst space joke. And don't forget to do us a solid and make sure to like, subscribe, and all those other cool podcast things because we're your fans just as much as you're ours. All right. Before we get carried away, let's do a couple of stories and then we'll get to the meat of the subject. Yes. First up, Virgin Galactic takes wing. That's right. That's right. So this week, uh, Virgin Galactic launched their first ever commercial space flight. So this is their first actual business trip uh, to suborbital space. They launched uh, uh, three uh, three members of the, uh, the Italian Air Force for uh, for Italy and for their National Science Foundation. They had performed something like 12, 13 experiments on on that flight. And and this was, of course, uh, if people remember, a suborbital flight. Uh, they used their spaceship to a uh, rocket plane uh, and its carrier plane, White Knight 2, uh, to basically launch uh, these three uh, customers, as well as an astronaut trainer, a member of the Virgin Galactic team, uh, into suborbital space about 50.2 miles, or I believe 52 miles or so uh, up. And of course, we can always debate, is that space? Is it not space? Is it 50 miles? Is it 62 miles? Uh, for all intents and purposes, Virgin Galactic uh, uh, you know, is promising a trip to space using NASA's 50-mile boundary and the U.S. Air Force. And so that's where that comes from. Uh, but it's a milestone. Uh, in, in, in a feat, because basically after five test flights with this uh, Spaceship 2 Unity, uh, this was their first ever commercial flight, and maybe opening the gates finally for the 700 plus uh, 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 passengers, uh, future they call them future astronauts, mm -hmm. that have been waiting in the wings for uh, well, a little since 2004 when Richard Branson announced the formation of this company. So it has almost been 20 years, so about 19 years you know, from that first flight from Virgin Galactic's being announced. Uh, that they're finally able to enter commercial service. And the company initially thought they could start flying passengers in 2007, and they had a lot of delays because it's harder than you think. They had a fatal accident, uh, uh, sadly, and they had to come back from that. 
And uh, and so now here they are off and running. The flight looks like it went nominal. The uh, passengers were really happy uh, afterward. They said that they were busy with their experiments, but uh, but they were able to look out the window and enjoy weightlessness as well. Very cool. Well, uh, glad to see that they made it. It's uh, high time. <laughs> so. <laughs> And I, yeah, you know, let's give them that it's space. But if you've been to orbit, like our guest today has been, you're looking down on that altitude from uh, 240-ish miles. So yeah, that that's that's real space. All right, uh, moving <laughs> along, uh, we have another dragon in space. China's got something very close to Falcon 9 coming up. And it's kind of stunning how similar it looks, isn't it? Yeah, this is actually from Space News and Andrew Jones over there who, who uh, keeps a really close eye on China's space program. And there is a, a private company there called Space Pioneer that has uh, a new rocket called Tianlong-3 and uh, it's or Sky Dragon 3. And it's there's a lot of parallels with SpaceX to show that uh, the company has been under close watch by some of its competitors uh, overseas. It's a, it's a two-stage kerosene-fueled rocket, which is exactly what uh, uh, SpaceX's Falcon 9 is, and its first stage is designed to be reusable, which SpaceX has proven now with over 200, uh, over 100 plus landings, maybe 200, 200 plus landings now of their, um, of their, 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 their rocket. So, um, so that's, it's, um, uh, it is, it seems like it's going to be a direct competitor now. And that's, that is something that, um, we've seen, uh, in different renderings from either, uh, a national program, uh, vehicles that uh, that China's uh, space agency has has shown, or uh, several of the different uh, private companies. So there is um, there is a, 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 a one company that has a, a methane engine, and they're able to to reach orbit recently. Uh, space Pioneer wants to launch something like fourteen tons uh, to uh, or seventeen tons to a low Earth orbit, fourteen tons uh, to a sun synchronous orbit. SpaceX's Falcon Nine can do a little bit more. 22 tons, but it just shows that that reusability aspect that SpaceX has proven uh, is there to say, and that people have been watching to see what works, which is this reusable first stage, these grid fins, which a lot of these designs have, uh, that the they've, they, they've seen the physics of it from SpaceX and they're borrowing those designs in their own new rockets there. This could launch, uh, in May, 2024 is what the, uh, uh the chief designer, uh, has said. Uh, and so we'll have to just track that and see how well does it perform? How are they going to launch it? Is it always going to be on land? Is it going to come back, uh, to an, uh, ocean landings like SpaceX does? We're not sure how they're going to do that, but um, this is a, a private company or a, 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 a you know, they, they, do, they do have some investment from uh, 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 China's uh, uh, space industry and the, the, the country, but they are a, a commercial company and we'll see how they're going to make that work. So, Ed, you flew on the shuttle and on Soyuz, if I remember correctly. Is it, uh, is it time for a good international competitor to come along for a crewed space flight? I think there is uh, lots of room for more competitors and not just government run, but private too, as we're seeing. And I mean, we already have at least uh, at least one other right now um, from a private corporation. We have uh, the, the Chinese also now launching regularly uh, with their Soyuz variant. And right. uh, I think the more the merrier. I think that's how we're going to make more rapid progress, to tell you the truth. That's a refreshing viewpoint. Thank you. All right. We are back and it's time to talk about the Asteroid Institute and Asteroid Day. Uh, Ed, you are a physicist with a Stanford PhD, which I greatly admire because I barely got through a master's program there and I can't imagine how hard it is not just to get a PhD, but to get one in physics at that institution. So hats off to you. Two shuttle flights, to your credit, a Soyuz flight extended stay aboard the ISS, which had to have been an amazing experience, and STS-106 was a construction flight. So you weren't just up there enjoying yourself staring out the cupola. You were helping build the International Space Station, right? Yeah, it was one of the early flights. The cupola wasn't even there yet. <laughs> so um, it was actually one, one, it was the first it was flight in preparation for continuous human presence. So STS-106's job was to attach the main living modules, the main life support systems, which is the Russian service module to the U.S. side. And as part of that, got to do spacewalk on the outside, uh, connecting those uh, connecting those two modules. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience. So besides your incredible career as an astronaut, uh, which is, of course, something I wanted to do when I was a young man, like most of us back in that day, until I climbed into a mercury training capsule when I was oh, probably in my early 20s and 
they set the hatch down on top of my head and about 30 seconds later i was ready to get out of that thing because i had broken into a cold sweat so i don't know how you guys do it the soyuz but again hats off to you but among the many things you've done since your time at nasa you co-founded the b612 foundation along with rusty schweikert and um that was in 2012 to promote achieved planetary defense, which we talk about a lot on the show. And uh, I don't think gets enough uh, enough public notice, frankly, um, to work to assure safety of Earth from killer asteroids, many of which we haven't found. So there's a lot of things to talk about here. But I wonder if you could start to get us started by talking about B612 Foundation and uh, the Asteroid Institute specifically. Yeah, the B612 Foundation was really founded uh, with the idea that we need to, at some point, be able to protect our planet from being hit by large asteroids. It's happened in the past, it will in the get, again in the future, unless we do something about it. So, you know, the, the asteroids come in all sizes, large to small. Um, it's the big ones that we are concerned about, but um, they're out there. They're orbiting in the, in the solar system, and sometimes they run into Earth. So. The Asteroid Institute is really is a program of B612 Foundation. So there's, there's a couple aspects to the problem. Uh, one of the aspects of the problem is uh, letting the public know through things like your, your great show and, and speaking engagements, testifying before Congress, things like that. Um, there is a public policy aspect, you know, how do we make these decisions and so on. And then there are the more technical aspects. How do we track, discover, and warn of uh, asteroids that have a chance of hitting the Earth. And the Asteroid Institute really handles the, the technical aspects. Um, and you can think of this as really building the first map of the solar system. Now, what does that mean? It means knowing the directions, velocities, and future locations of everything in the solar system, because that's how we will protect the Earth, because you need to know that an asteroid is on its way to hit the earth in order to do anything about it, right? You, you, if you have no advanced warning, there is sort of by definition, nothing you can do. And so uh, we're involved at the Asteroid Institute with this, all of the science and technology and software for helping find track and uh, calculate the trajectories of, of where everything is in, in the solar system. You know, and I, I wanted to ask about the, just the risk in, in general, because, you know, you're, you've, been, you've been laying out a lot of the, the, the science that, 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 you know, the projects that, that, that you're going on. But we're talking on Asteroid Day, and when the public thinks about asteroids, they might think about science fiction and, oh, I've seen Armageddon or I've seen, you know, Meteor, that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, today, Asteroid Day, as we're recording this, in 1908, there wasn't uh, a meteor that exploded over uh, Tunguska in Siberia. You know, we've seen a lot of those uh, pictures of the of the uh, the impact and the damage there, and if people don't want to look back that far, uh, you know, just a, a a handful of years ago, uh, a, a meteor, you know, uh, a, a bolai blew up over Chelyabinsk and damaged that city in in, in Russia, a, as well. Uh, so when when you're explaining kind of like that that real world risk to people, how do you kind of put it into their, you know, those types of terms where it doesn't just become a, a sci-fi or an academic discussion for them? Yeah, that's exactly the, the examples that we use. The explosion over Tunguska in 1908 was much larger than any of our sort of, you know, standard sized nuclear weapons that we have in our arsenal. Uh, it, it destroyed an area roughly the size of the LA basin. Um, thankfully, it was sort of unpopulated forest. But um, that's the kind of scale that we talk about. Every few hundred years, that sort of thing hits the earth. Okay, now most of the earth is unpopulated. Most of the earth is ocean or, you know, not a lot of people. And that was the case then, uh, but not all of this. Not all, and as time goes by, less and less of the earth is totally unpopulated. Now, 2013 was an interesting one. It wasn't anywhere near as big. Uh, it was an asteroid the size of which only hits the earth about every few decades. So that, you know, we saw it 10 years ago that, that's about right. Um, its explosive energy was about 30 times the size of the bomb dropped over Hiroshima. Yeah. It's about half a megaton. And luckily, it didn't explode over the city. 
it was an interesting case because it wasn't coming down at the city, it was flying over the top of it. And so most of the energy was directed forward over the top of the city and missed the city. Had it not been that case, um, we could have been looking at a million casualties. So um, really? a lot of people got really lucky that day. And that's an example of a case where there was no previous tracking of this asteroid and it just arrived out of the blue. And um, there's an interesting interview with some of the NASA scientists at uh, on, I believe, 60 Minutes, uh, in which they uh, exclaimed that, uh, or when asked about it, they said that they found out about it on Twitter huh. after the oh, fact. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I don't think that's acceptable, um, especially if we can do something about it, and we can. Yeah. And that was the same day. There was another asteroid that that flew by Earth the same exact day that NASA actually had like a lot of live tracking for. That's and, right. And they were they were excited for that. And then look over here, something else happened. Yeah. Um, so these things sort of happen. And the other thing, you know, so that people know about is they will all oh, the dinosaurs, you know, were killed off by an asteroid. But true. That was right. a much larger asteroid nearly wiped out all of life on Earth. So something like 90 percent of all species were gone after that that. Uh, impact but if you look at the history of earth's uh those asteroids of that size have hit the earth probably a hundred times or more and there are hundreds of mass extinctions um you know the the dinosaur one is one that we can definitely correlate to a particular asteroid with a particular crater and you know we know that you know fairly accurately the date of that uh, but there are many many mass extinctions and we know that the earth's the life on Earth has been reset like probably a hundred times by large asteroid impacts. It has happened in the past. It's not like one, it's not a one off incident. So, um, you know, uh, it's sort of a roulette game we play. So, as part of this roulette game, and, and the solar system is kind of a shooting gallery when it comes to, to asteroids and, and meteoroids. Um, NASA talks a lot about how many of the larger near Earth objects that they've managed to chart and track and predict trajectories for. But you were saying, so Chalubinsk was, if I remember right, about 60 feet, right? About 20 yeah, meters. Yeah, meters. That's, that's about yeah. 60. And that could have, could have taken out a million people, something that yeah, small? Yeah, had it been approaching the city more, more head on, yes. So if I remember correctly, looking at the numbers, there's a lot of those in our neighborhood that are predicted at least to be not charted. And that's a big part of what you're working on, right? Yeah. In fact, you know, it, it would be fair to say that we have tracked a very tiny percentage, less than a percent of the asteroids that size. So as things stand today, um, an asteroid of that size is likely to arrive unannounced because, you know, 99% of them plus are not tracked by the time you get to larger and larger asteroids the world community nasa as being a particularly uh strong funder of this work um by the time you get to the ones that would likely wipe out human civilization um we've we've found we believe around 95 percent of those and um we can get into the business of how you know that you found 95 percent when you haven't found 100 percent yet it's an interesting way to do it. Um, but um, that being said, that means likely if there is an asteroid, you know, at the 95% level that's large enough to wipe out human civilization, then we have seen it and we've tracked it and we know that then it's not going to hit in the next, call it 100 years. Now, as you get smaller and smaller sizes, ones that would only destroy a continent or only set the world economy back for, you know, a thousand years or only send us to the dark ages, that sort of thing. Um, then we get less and less, uh, uh, less and less complete in our our map. So our, our you know our map has large gaping holes in it. And uh, if I understand correctly, it's especially hard to find asteroids that have uh, that are whose primary orbit is inside of Earth's orbit. Right, they're closer to the sun. Uh, yes, but those also present less of a danger. Now, it's really just size that's the issue. The smaller you get. The harder it, the closer it must approach to our telescopes here on Earth, in order for us to see it. So it takes longer to to um, get a good catalog of them, a good mapping of them. And so, so I guess it sounds like the, our options 
uh, at or, or to have either better tracking or, or I guess some sort of ready uh, uh, defense plan in place. And of course, NASA did have a recent mission that we saw with the DART mission, but how, what, what would be the next step then to fill those gaps that you were just talking about uh, yeah. to, to make sure that, that the foundation or the Institute uh, or the rest of us are, are paying attention, I guess, as, as, as much as we can to, to find these things before they, we have to deal with them. Well, if you're asking about the question about what the next step is in terms of what do you do once you find something, that's the deflection aspect. And that's mm -hmm. actually, I, I believe, technically much simpler, much easier to solve than the, the issue of mapping. Finding so, and tracking so. is much harder technically. But but in terms of detection, right, which is the key part, yes. uh, we either need new missions or that, that you're working on, or uh, is it better telescopes on Earth, or is it both? Uh, you need a number of things. Number one, you want you need to be able, if your telescopes are based near the Earth, which all future telescopes currently in work are, both either in space, still close to Earth, or on Earth, then you need better telescopes. So here the news is very good. You've got two very large projects, one of which is, uh, uh, coming online very recent, uh, very soon. That is the Large Synoptic Survey, uh, which uh, has been recently renamed into the Vera Rubin Observatory. It is a project of the National Science Foundation Department of e Department of Energy. Um, so um, NASA doesn't promote it as much because it's not one of their projects, but um, it's a National Science Foundation project. It's nearly a nearly a billion dollar telescope been under construction for quite some time, um, but it is going to have first light uh, sort of towards the end of next year. And then official operations will begin um, uh, you know, six months or a year after a year after that, depending upon how the uh, commissioning goes. But uh, it is a ground based telescope in Chile it will be the world's largest survey telescope for finding and tracking asteroids. It does a lot of other incredibly good science, including looking at the the uh, expansion rate of the universe for helping us understand um, the, the origins of uh, structure in the, in the universe, galaxies, you know, how the universe formed. Uh, but uh, I think one of the most important aspects of, of the Vera Rubin Observatory will be the fact that it will increase the rate at which we discover asteroids by about a factor of 10. It's about 10 times more effective than all other telescopes combined. Wow. So this is the big dog. This is the yeah. one to change everything. Separately, NASA has just recently in the last, um, about a year ago, approved a, an infrared space telescope called NEOSM, which hopefully could fly by the end of this decade. Um, it's got funding, but you know, it, it's last launch date I heard is 2028. So maybe 2029, it could be commissioned. Um, its capabilities are very roughly similar to the LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory. But when you have two of them now, you and um, and they, they tend to look in slightly different directions, meaning um, the, the, the principal direction that LSST can look, which is away from the sun, um, is different than the principal direction which the uh, NEO-SM, which is, looks sort of perpendicular to the sun. So that they'll, they'll be nicely complementary. Um, but uh, it will also allow us the ability to more yet improve our tracking even better. Now, both of these are going to be great in that they will um, help us get down to a, a completeness, meaning we will have tracked most of the asteroids down to the size of, uh, of about a 300 or so megaton explosion. Okay. <laughs> Only, no. only a 300 megaton. Yeah, right. no, no, remember that all the bombs used in World oh. War II, if you put them into a giant pit, including the nuclear weapons, including the Trinity weapons, all the test ones, threw them all together, it's about a third of that. Wow. wow. Okay, so, oh, three, so it's a big step up from where we are today, but it's still not anywhere as close to being where we want to be. Mm -hmm. so, so there can will talk be about things oh. beyond this, but mm -hmm. great step, you know, big thing to look forward to next year when Vera Rubin uh, gets first light. It's, it's been frustrating to watch uh, Neo Surveyor slash any of the previous iteration names uh, kind of crutch along as long as it has. I think it's been in the making one way or another for, at this point, I guess, what, 12 years? 
15 oh, years maybe uh much longer than that so. yeah but I'm, I'm glad it finally got funded i hope they they keep that funding there yeah Could you talk but again a, little- a big change is not neosm it's vera rubin okay because they're of similar performance but mm-hmm. Remember that most of the discoveries will happen by whoever turns on first because they are similar performance. Mm-hmm. So um, most of the discoveries will have been made that there are, we're capable of by Vera Rubin and they will be confirmed by Neo SM. Had the timelines been reversed, it would have been the other way. Got it. But really our discoveries will start with Vera Rubin. And that's the one that we really need to look forward to. It's, 90% complete right now. They're in, they're in software testing right now. The main mirror is in, uh, telescopes, uh, uh, you know, observatory buildings complete. Um, it's very close. That's exciting. So Ed, could you talk a little bit more about this, uh, four dimensional space map? And I assume the fourth dimension means plotting trajectories forward towards where these things might end up that we don't want them to be. Is that right? That's right. There's, there's really, uh, we live in a sort of four dimensional world at minimum of four dimensional, depends on the physicists you talk to, but, um, three spatial dimensions, X, Y, Z up, down, left, right, if you'd like, and time because things are moving. So the thing to know about everything in, in space in our solar system is everything is moving. There's nothing that's stationary. So you can't just say, where is something now? Like if you, if you look at Google maps and look at, you know, trying to get to some particular coffee shop. I'm asking where it is, but there is nothing in the space map, which is stationary. Okay. We are moving around the sun. Everything is moving. So those are your four dimensions. Now I I do want to point out that um, the reasons for building the map are more than just doom and preventing doom and gloom. Right. Um, If you really think about what, where we are right now with uh, the development of space, we're in an interesting point right now where, It's taking off. In fact, uh, you know, the growth rate of satellites launched into space is doubling every roughly 26 months. Okay. And this is a similar growth rate to, to the internet number of users, um, between 1995 and 2005, the fastest growth period of the internet. And, um, you know, uh, if you look at the number of satellites in space today and you look at it two years from now, it will be double. Or two years ago, it was half of what it is today. And that is a ridiculous growth rate. It's been going on for uh, seven, eight years now. And um, so space is growing. So what is space going to look like? Or what, you know, what kind of developments are we going to see in space over the next 10 years, 20 years, right? You know, where the number of satellites might be 100 times what we have now, or the number of spacecraft. And that if you look at the history of previous frontiers in which we've opened up, all of them, uh, the development of all of them has been driven by mapping. It's one of the very first things you do when you open up any frontier. So um, I'll give some historical examples, you know, the uh, sort of considered the great age of exploration, the 1400s and 1500s, um, the great powers of the day, they sent mapping expeditions out. You know, so why would you do such a thing? Well, there's always sort of three classes of reasons that uh, we send, uh, that we map a new frontier. And and you can sort of um, remember them easily by thinking of them as uh, fear, greed, and curiosity. Okay, so curiosity. Well, you just want to know what's out there. It's science or exploration, just what is out there. Okay. Um, But the ones that really drive it, though, are the fear and greed aspects of it. So um, greed is just shorthand for commerce. So it's maybe a little uh, derogatory, but it's really, you know, if you want to have commerce in a location, you need to know where things are. You need to know navigable routes. You need to know um, how to get from here to there and, um, and so on. And as well as be able to map locations of things for just uh, uh, for the ability to state claims to things like if, I'm going to develop something, I need to be able to mark that this is the area that I'm developing and, mm. and get some rights to do that. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to raise the money to put in the infrastructure required to develop something. And, and generally, when it, that's location-based. So, and finally, uh, the fear aspect of it, well, there's a defense aspect to all you know, mapping efforts throughout human history. 
Um, usually it's points of defense, that sort of thing. So, you know, if you think about the 1500s world in England and Portugal and Italy and Spain, they were sending out uh, expeditions to map things so that they could have points of defense, trade routes, and, and you know, and, and explore what's out there. You know, if you look at the maps uh, in those days, um, they, they, they rapidly improved. So, you know, that's an example. Think about um, even the development of the United States, that when we purchased the Louisiana Purchase, the very first thing we did is we sent Lewis and Clark out to map it. And they had, they had it was called the Corps of Discovery. And there they had three goals, find navigable routes. So that's for commerce points of defense. That's the, um, you know, the fear aspect of it and bring back samples of flora and fauna. That's the curiosity. So it's very explicit what their goals were. And they built the first maps of the Western United States. So even, even in more recent times, um, a, a sort of, uh, another frontier it's not a, a geographic frontier but it was the frontier of human genomics and what's the very first thing we did in you know the 1990s in order to advance the frontier of human genomics we mapped the human genome why because curiosity well the the record of human beings you know who we are and how we got to be the way we are is written in our dna um for the commerce aspect of it, well, there are many diseases whose keys are genetic, and in order to it um, to address these diseases or find cures for them or understand how they how they form, uh, we need a map of the human genome. And then from the fear aspect of it, well, again, there are, there are many diseases that we. It turns out that you you need to know what the human you know the relationship between different genes, the locations are on chromosomes and so on. So um, I believe the space frontier is going to be no different. So over the next few decades, and again, at the growth rates we're seeing, we're not talking a thousand years, we're talking decades here because of this doubling rate, this, this Moore's law that we're seeing in space mm. is, uh, you know, doubling a number of spacecraft every two years, 26 months. So what are the things we're going to need to open up the space frontier? Well. You need to know where everything is. And the vast majority of objects in our solar system are not planets. They're asteroids. They vastly, there are millions of them. And uh, if you'd like, our maps of the solar system are very similar to the maps of the oceans from about the mid 1400s. We had some <laughs> continents and nothing else. Right. No, you, you don't know where the harbors are. You don't know where the islands are. You don't know where, you know. The straits are and any of those that detail was gone or was missing at that time and uh i think that's that's what we need to build up the, this mapping capability for our our opening up of space so if you have a space map you can you can chart um you know both where all the resources are you can protect the earth because you will know in advance of it if an asteroid, hit, you know, decades in advance, if an asteroid is going to hit the Earth, and we will understand much more about the formation of the solar system and how Earth got to be the way it is. So, so for the same three reasons, we're, we need to map space. It's a little more complicated mm -hmm. than the static maps uh, that we think of, you know, like chart on the wall kind of thing, because again, everything's moving. And a modern map is different than a, you know, uh, even a map of 20 years ago. If you remember driving around in your car, you had these little maps of your city, right? You know, it's yes. like Thomas Guide. It. <laughs> Nowadays it's on a phone. And, and but what, what's changed about mapping so much in the last couple of, you know, 20 years or so is the fact that maps are now really synonymous with services, like the, the ability to ship data, share data. Um, add things to maps and so on. That's what makes Google Maps what it is. It's those services. And the same thing is going to be true of space map. So it's really a software project at heart. It's telescopes plus software engineering. Mm -hmm. And building all those tools like calculation of orbits, trajectories, locations of things in the future, et cetera. That's a software project. And that's what we're good at. So at the Asteroid Institute, 
that's where we're focusing on the software aspects of discovery of asteroids and um, calculation of trajectories and sharing and uh, making uh, data open. So I, I want to make sure we, we have a chance to talk about the Schweikert Prize, but uh, one of the things I want to ask you about, we touched briefly on interdiction, but you developed a, a system design called the Gravity Tractor, which is is one way of doing that. And of course, as Tarek mentioned, we've all seen the films with, you know, oh, we're going to go plant nuclear weapons on the asteroid and we'll blow it to smaller pieces that'll come pelt the Earth <laughs> instead. That might be better. Um, but I think you've got a better idea. Can you tell us about the Gravity Tractor? Yeah, the Gravity Tractor has is one of many methods of deflecting an asteroid. Um, and remember that there is no single method that will be used always. They're, they're all, they're, they're different. They're all very case dependent, but they're like, we're likely almost certainly to use a combination of techniques when we de when we did de uh, deflect an asteroid for real. So the gravity tractor, all it simply does is take a small spacecraft, you hover near an asteroid, but in order to hover near it, you you direct your thrusters not down at the asteroid, but off to the side. Mm. And the tiny gravitational force between your, your spacecraft and the asteroid, which may only be less than, you know, a, a Newton, which is, you know, you know, hold up an apple, you know, that that kind of uh, thing. That little force, if you can stay in position for months, adds up. Because remember that the to deflect an asteroid from hitting the Earth, you're not trying to change its trajectory by a lot. You're trying to change its trajectory by maybe a millionth of one percent, assuming you find it early enough, right? Yes. Um, and if you do that a decade or so in advance, in general, you can prevent an asteroid from hitting the Earth. It's a very precision thing. Now, the gravity tractor is not suitable for for deflecting larger asteroids, but it is suitable for doing the fine tuning. So in a real asteroid deflection case, you are likely to use what's called a primary deflection, something that has a little more oomph to it. Um, something like the kinetic impactor that we saw that NASA did where the, we test deflected a binary asteroid uh, with the DART missions, a tremendous success. It was last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did change the, the velocity through space of the, the combined system by about a millionth of a percent. So, it, it works, you know, not huge changes, um, but it works. But remember, in a real case, what you're likely to do, because there's uncertainties in, in telescope observations, what you want to do is you want to get a satellite or spacecraft up close by and with you know radio transponder on it. And then we can really precision measure the orbit of that asteroid. And then we can confirm everything, you know, double check everything before we go do all, you know, do a primary deflection method. And then you want to stand back, then hit it with your primary deflection method, like say running into it with a small spacecraft like DART. Then you're going to go back in and remeasure. Did it work? And rather than doing that through telescopes and, and going back through that process, the rapid way to do it and the much more accurate way to do it is to have a spacecraft there, but you're already there. So now you just, you, you, you move back in, you know, you might stand off by a few miles and then come back in, remeasure the trajectory. Now, what the gravity tractor is really good to do is tuning up that orbit. If it's not exactly where you want it, you can you can uh, uh, do a fine fine adjustment to it because it's much it's a controllable thing. Unlike the running into it with a spacecraft, which you know prediction of that you'd be lucky to be within a factor of two hundred percent of. Mm. I mean, it's like predicting where all the pieces are going to fly in a car accident. Really difficult. But a gravity tractor can be used like you because you're measuring it continuously, the trajectory. You you start when you want and you stop when you want when you get to where you want to be. So we can fine-tune position it so that the asteroid does not just come back, fly by the earth, and then come back and hit it a few years later. Because that's that's called the keyhole trajectory, and that you're always in danger of that when you make your deflection. So I think the gravity tractor will be used in combination with something like uh in all cases, you will use a gravity tractor plus a primary deflection um, for for any realistic case. Now, remembering with the with the number of asteroids we're about to discover using the Vera Rubin Observatory, and then hopefully someday NEOSM, I think there's a chance here, a pretty decent chance that in the next decades or so, we will be deflecting an asteroid for real. Mm. So this is, this is actually in our lifetimes. I think we're going to be seeing a real life case of doing this.
So if, if something happens to be, uh, let's say there was a, a much larger asteroid that really had us worried, and either we detected it late for some reason or its trajectory somehow got shifted, and I realize I'm kind of wandering off into sci-fi land here, <laughs> but if it becomes an urgent, more short-term situation, what are some of the more powerful interdictions that might work? Well, then you're talking much larger transfers of momentum. So then you're going to have to you're in the you're in the nuclear weapons category of things. But let's be let's be clear here. Remember, we don't believe that we're going to have to use our things like um, running into with spacecraft or gravity tractors more often than once every some number of decades, right? Mm -hmm. And and the size range you're talking about is so much rarer because the larger asteroids are much rarer. You're you're, you're you kind of expect that we'll have to do that about a thousand times before we'll have to use. A or you know a hundred to a thousand times in a row before we ever have to use a larger one. So you're you're talking about time scales of order millions of years for for that other case. As long as we do our job with with building the space map, you know, and over the next decade, uh, I I I firmly believe we will. And so, um, you know, while it is possible, you are talking the one in a million case thing of using something like that. And, um, you know, if some, and if we are talking something that large existential risk, you know, end of human civilization thing, we, we can pull out all the stops, right? Cause then there is nothing more important by definition anywhere on earth. Um, we've been we've, get to that point. So mm, thank you. Yeah. But the real is, is not that if that makes sense. Yes. Well, we've been talking a lot. And about a planetary defense and like like you just mentioned how how much of a uh um an investment just you know is being made in space right now over time and a lot of that uh you know is going to depend on the people that are supporting those projects supporting the search uh for for these asteroids and and i did want to mention as, as rod uh, said earlier um that for asteroid day just you know uh uh, the the foundation B612 Foundation has announced this, the Schweikert Prize in honor of Apollo 9 astronaut Rusty Schweikert, you know, uh, uh, longtime uh, proponent of uh, of uh, the foundation and the search for these asteroids and whatnot to um, to recognize individuals who have made exceptional contributions to planetary defense and advancing life's evolution journey. This is from the announcement uh, today, and I was hoping that you can kind of help us understand what that prize is. Who are you looking to uh, to recognize for it, and why is it important to to kind of honor th those types of contributions to what is uh, what is essentially kind of a, a pretty pivotal uh, a, a, a service for our planet and for all of us on it? Yeah, uh, first off, the, the award is in honor of of Rusty, who is uh, an absolutely amazing leader, and you know he he's the one who really helped us take this from the realm of crazy movies into something that's seriously debated which serious money is now put towards. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think a in large aspect, we, we have a lot to thank from Rusty for, you know, being out there in the wilderness screaming about this problem for decades and it's had an effect. Now you combine this with the increased levels of investment in all areas of space. Right now we're in an area where these things are about our things are really happening, right? The dark mission happened. Um, private missions are going on, you know, the B612, the B612 Asteroid Institute is at the forefront of the software uh, for building the space map. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things happening. But one of the things which Rusty realized is that you have to support early career professionals. There needs to be motivations and, uh, um, and uh, recognition of work in this field as a serious academic uh, area of both study and research and um because it is not an area in which you can get a major in at any mm -hmm. institute right now you you can't go and say i'm going to major in planetary defense at any place but you can go major in a lot of other things but in order to get academic funding and to advance early careers of science promising scientists they need a route in to do this and that's why this is so important mm -hmm. so it, it's a new field didn't exist 20 years ago. So um, I, I think this is the Schweikart Prize is going to be very important at stimulating uh, this new field of, of research. And this is a, a $10,000 
prize uh and it starts in 2024 do you do you expect it's not going to be like a one-off for one uh oh, no, you know one person it's going to be it's, it's going to be a several prize it's mm -hmm. an annual prize so um you know and the idea is that that is the kind of seed funding and recognition that early career professionals that it makes a difference mm -hmm. so we we've talked yeah, a lot about using young Sorry. phd that that sort of stuff <laughs> it, makes it really does well, we have at least one billionaire that I know that listens to the show, so maybe we'll uh, we'll see well, a donation. Come they want to make. I, I hope so. <laughs> if they want to make a difference in the future of humanity, this is a way to do it, because we do know with one hundred percent certainty that this is something we have to do. So we've talked a lot about why asteroids can be icky, but uh, you alluded to when you were talking about your space map that you also, when you're looking for resources out there that of course you need to know where they are and what their trajectories are so you can intercept and and deal with them i wonder if you could talk a little bit about the value of asteroids both scientifically uh for looking at the very earliest form of the solar system and also for resources sure i mean um the science aspects to this are that they are relics of the early formation of the solar system in composition and in their orbital nature, the, the distribution of orbits tells us about how the solar system itself evolved because the locations of the planetary orbits has changed over time and that affects the distribution of the orbits of asteroids. So one way to tell the history of the solar system is by understanding the distribution of asteroids. So that's the sort of science aspect of it. Um, I don't want to get hung up too much on the resource aspects of it as just all of commerce does depend upon where things are, right? And so um, navigation is a big part of, I believe, what uh, development of space is going to take. I believe resources is, is an aspect of it because it is the easiest place to get um, resources, in particular water, fuel um, in space. Um, but it's, it's going to be hard to predict what how this is all going to go, you know, as how does commerce develop in space? And it will. In the same way, in 1990, if someone asked you, how is commerce going to proceed on the internet? You, I'm not sure if anybody would have predicted correctly what we see today, right? And Moore's law took over and then things developed and, and uh, things changed. People found out things and, you know, we wouldn't have predicted what has happened over, you know, the, the, the 20 doublings that we've seen since sort of the beginning of the internet age um and in 40 40 years from now 20 doublings from now um of the, of the space development and it's only been a few it's only been about six years since we've hit this exponential mm -hmm. growth rate. right um six seven years since 20 about 2016 is about when it, the knee and the curve was and uh what will space look like in 40 years as difficult to, to predict as what would the internet look like, you know, if you made that prediction in the late eighties. Is so. there, is there, um, with, with, with these resources, like, like the Vera Rubin observatory, like uh, a space-based uh, telescope mapping, um, is uh, I'm, I'm curious about the analysis part of it, you know, like the, the, the software that the Institute, is, is working on, for example, because it seems like with more advanced capability becomes a, a an at scale increase in the amount of data. Now you will have to be able to process to find uh, uh, these objects to map uh, the solar system, you know, in 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 the detail that uh, is clearly needed. And and I'm I'm curious what the what the what the tools you're looking at or that you feel are needed to deal with with what would be like a big data onslaught when it comes to planetary defense to, to map what would be, uh, it sounds like a, like a mountain load of, of objects that you might have to be tracking over, over time there. Yeah. There's a mountain load of objects and trajectories and orbits and stuff to calculate. And so cloud computing definitely is the way to go here. Um, just as it is now, you know, modern maps, Google maps is, is lives in the cloud. Right. But again, what, what's going to make it, I think revolutionary is the services, the easy ability to send a trajectory to somebody else or to another, or to make use of them or for other operators to 
not have to build their own map. So why was Google Maps, which I worked on, I spent a number of years at Google, mm -hmm. on working on Google Maps, what made it so revolutionary? It made it so that other companies didn't have to build their own maps and yet could use mapping information. So Uber and Lyft and uh, Zillow and uh, 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 numerous other companies built whole businesses using Google Maps. It fostered an enormous ecosystem of companies that, um, that could not have done it had not somebody else built a map with services that allowed them to using API calls, you know, get geographical data uh, and use it easily. Okay. That aspect of it, that software, aspect, if there's going to be rapid development in space, there needs to be easy way for companies to not have to build their own maps in order to do uh, things that are critical to their business. And so that's why I think this, that is the fundamental um, thing that I think the Institute is bringing along is a software engineering mindset towards these problems. Mm -hmm. And thinking of these things as open services with open source algorithms and the ability to add, share, and see what's under the hood, um, not just open data. So there is, yes, there is a lot of data, but it is making a system that just works. And, you know, there's a big difference between a system that works with 90% of the time and but 10% of the time goes down. You would never use that. You would say, that's a piece of crap, right? <laughs> if one out of 10 times I, I did directions on Google Maps and it didn't work, I'd never use it, right? The amount of software engineering to take it from 90% works, you know, like, like research project level to really works and I can count on it, can build a business on top of this is well, like Google Maps has put billions of dollars of investment into it. Thankfully, the development of software over the last, call it 15 years, has been such that much, much smaller teams can build cloud-based services for fractions of the cost of what it took 15 years ago. Um, because there are so many cloud-based tools for running services that didn't exist 15 years ago. And uh, things like Kubernetes and uh, you know, containerization of things and automated systems like uh, that uh, Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure have made easily available and cheap. You combine that with cheap processing uh, in data centers, cloud computing, and you can build uh, services now with small teams. So the Asteroid Institute only has like five full-time software engineers and Yet five, a team of five can do what a team of a hundred did 15 years ago. And uh, just due to advances in available software tools. And um, that's what's allowing us to do, you know, it, it, this is that virtuous cycle that saw how the internet grew so fast and that we're seeing in, in space development today with, you know, the, the myriad of companies now building spacecraft and launching them easily, small teams, because they don't have to build their own rocket. They don't have to build their own tracking. They don't have to, you know, they can they can uh, contract with SpaceX to put it up there or somebody to put it in orbit. They can contract with Leo Labs to track it, know where it is. Uh, they can contract, they don't have to do all these things. And that same virtuous cycle is happening in space, but in, on the software side that we're taking advantage of that at the Asteroid Institute on the software side. Well, this has been really exciting. I want to thank you so much for joining us today and wish you luck with the rest of Asteroid Day, which will become a regular thing for us, I think. <laughs> and uh, thank our audience for joining us today to talk about planetary defense and other things with Dr. Ed Liu. Uh, Ed, besides uh, the B612 site, which is at b612foundation.org, uh, where would we ideally follow your latest activities to stay up to date? Uh, well, the mapping work is at uh, b612.ai, which mm -hmm. uh, you've been showing. And uh, you can see some of the services that we have available for uh, both professional astronomers as well as just, you know, kind of look at things around. But we're really talking about mostly services for professional astronomers um, because I think that's where we need to work right now in order to build this, this map. We need to work with the observatory. Very good. Tark, where could we track you down when we need you? 
Well, before that, I'll just remind everyone that if they are interested in learning more about the Schweikert Prize, because we didn't mention it at that point, mm-hmm. but they can go to the uh, B612 uh, Foundation's uh, website. And that the open call, by the way, uh, to for nominations for that starts in October, which I didn't mention when we were talking about it earlier. But it starts in October. The first prizes will be awarded in 2024. And there'll be more details on what exactly they're looking for uh, coming out soon. Exactly. So watch that right. space there at the, at the B612 Foundation's website. But for me, as always, uh, on uh, on uh, on space.com, uh, uh, tr- just trying to see what else is space. Very excited. Uh, if you're looking for me this weekend, you'll find me watching the Euclid uh, Space Telescope launch uh, from SpaceX. We've got our, our writer, Elizabeth Howell, down in Florida for that there. But uh, you can always find me on Twitter at Tarek J. Malik, too. All right. Uh, has it been great? And I liked <laughs> your joke, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Did you bring in one of your own? Oh, I have a lot of good ones. So um, a uh, bartender says to the tachyon, hey, what do you have? And then a tachyon walks into a bar. <laughs> oh, that that is definitely uh, moonshot territory. Uh, 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 physics jokes, you can never get enough of them, right? Okay. Well, and you can always track me down at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit.tv. We love to get your email and comments. And don't forget to check out space.com, the websites of the name, and, of course, the National Space Society, which is also keenly interested in planetary defense at nss.org. Both are good places to satisfy your space flight cravings. organizations, too. New episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so to make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, and give us reviews. And don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad-free at Club Twit, as well as some extras only available there including new shows for just $7 per month. And you can follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much, Tarek. I will see you on the flip side. Take care. Thank you. Happy Asteroid Day. Oh, hey, that's a really nice iPhone you have there. You totally picked the right color. Hey, since you do use an iPhone and maybe use an iPad or an Apple Watch or an Apple TV, well, you should check out iOS Today. It's a show that I, Micah Sargent, and my co-host Rosemary Orchard host every Tuesday right here on the Twit Network. It covers all things iOS, tvOS, HomePod OS, Watch OS, iPad OS. It's all the OSs that Apple has on offer. And we love to give you tips and tricks about making the most of those devices, checking out great apps and services, and answering your tech questions. I hope you check it out.